Hi, and welcome to The Bridge. Thanks so much for tuning in. We are a Markham Community Church located in the greater Toronto area with a passion for helping you engage in an authentic, life-giving community. We would love to connect with you further. Please take a moment and check out our website where you can find more information about our ministry. Well, we hope you're blessed by today's message. You know, I read a story of a rancher who was visiting on an invite to a farmer. And so the farmer showed him all around and um, showed him where the tomatoes are growing and the cucumbers and the squash and then went over and showed him where he built a uh, tree house for his children and the rancher just said wow is that all, is this all you have is this how big your land is and the farmer proudly said yes this is my land and the farm uh, rancher went again and said is this all you have this is all your land and the farmer said, yeah, this is all I have. And then the rancher replied and said, well, son, back home I would get in my car when the sun would rise and I would drive and drive and drive and drive and when the sun would set, I would be only halfway across my land. And the farmer quickly replied and said, you know, I used to have a car like that. This morning we're going to talk about a very important topic, sensitive topic, and um, a challenging one, where I'd like to invite you, if there is anything that you may disagree with or would like further clarification with, please do send me an email or I'd love to meet with you and talk to you about the topic we're going to look at. We're ending our series on influence, and we've looked at some important topics such as atheism and racism, legalism, narcissism, and last week materialism and how we're living in a society with all of these philosophies and ideologies and how they either influence us or whether we influence the conversation. But today we'd like to look at another ism known as religious pluralism with the question, do all religions lead to God? Do all religions lead to God? And that's why I say some may agree, some may disagree, and I would love to have a conversation with you based on the sermon today. Now, Christianity's central claim may be its most controversial, because it's a claim that says that Jesus Christ alone connects humanity to God. This exclusive statement that Jesus is the only way to salvation and eternal life, the ultimate joy and peace comes through him is actually offensive to many people. Maclean's magazine had an article titled, How Canadian Are You? And in that article, it was said that about 30% of Canadians are very uncomfortable around evangelical Christians. Why? Because Christians are viewed as narrow-minded bigots, because they believe that their way is the only way, and their way is the right way. So Christians are, are treated as narrow-minded bigots because of their truth claim. Now I know many of us may wrestle with the claim of exclusivity. How could God say to all these people that they are wrong and are going to be without Him because they believe in another religion? How could that be possible? Why doesn't all roads lead to the same God? Or do they all do? Our culture has been influenced by the philosophy of religious pluralism. Religious pluralism is one that believes that all religions have some measure of truth and are just merely different paths to the same God or to some transcendent being. So while atheism says that all religions are false, on the other side, religious pluralism says that all religions are true. Atheism says that all religions are false and religious pluralism says that all religions are true. Gandhi said, my position is that all great religions are fundamentally equal. Oprah made this statement when she said, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe there's only one way. Actually, there are many path, diverse paths leading to God. So the question is, what do you believe? Do you believe that there are many diverse paths leading to the same God? Or is there only one way? Now, 
Christianity would respond to religious pluralism by saying that this philosophy generally comes out of a place of good intentions. It's an intention of acceptance and tolerance. Canada is a cultural mosaic rather than a melting pot, where traditions and cultures and expressions are retained by immigrants rather than swallowed up by a host culture. We live in a pluralistic culture where people from various backgrounds and religions desire to live in peace and harmony with their neighbors and friends and co-workers. Canada is so multicultural and multi-religious. And so Christians need to have dialogue and be friends with people of different faiths and actually even fight for the right to practice their religion and hold to their convictions and their beliefs. Sometimes we don't realize that when we take away the right of some people to practice their religion, we also take away our own right. Because the government sees religion as an entity, as a whole. And so the right to practice our different religions is a Canadian value that we must protect. Now, every Christian must be accepting and loving from people of all different backgrounds and religious backgrounds. We need to respect even if we disagree. Now, because you accept someone doesn't mean that you have to agree with what they believe. Our culture assumes that if my beliefs are different from your beliefs, or if I'm critical of something that you may do or you may believe, that I am now intolerant or bigoted. And so we mistake something, and we mistake the difference between cultural pluralism and metaphysical pluralism. Cultural pluralism is the acceptance and celebration of different cultures, peoples, races, and religions. Metaphysical pluralism is accepting as true all the ideas and convictions and worldviews of those peoples and religions. So there is a difference. Cultural pluralism is good and necessary and healthy. But metaphysical pluralism is actually a disaster. Why? Because all beliefs cannot be true without fundamentally changing what they are. While we stand for people's rights to, be, uh, to believe, the right to believe and practice what they may believe, we don't have to agree with what they believe. Richard Mao said, Christian civility does not require us to approve of what other people believe or do. It is one thing to insist that other people have the right to express their basic convictions. It's another thing to say that they have the right in doing so, that they are right in doing so. You see, Christianity is not the only religion that believes in exclusivity. Islam is exclusive. Buddhism, Sikhism, even atheism, though not a religion but a philosophy, excludes all other religions and says that it is untrue. It's impossible to find a worldview that isn't exclusive in some way. The more you study the different religions and worldviews, you come to the conclusion that the major worldviews are superficially similar, but fundamentally different. Superficially similar, they may have aspects of prayer and giving, may gather together in local places of worship, but the fundamental truth and the fundamental beliefs are vastly different. For example, let's take Christianity and Islam. There are three things we need to believe in Christianity in order to be reconciled to God. The first is that Jesus is God, that Jesus died on the cross, and Jesus rose from the dead. Islam asserts that those three beliefs are wrong, and believing in them would take you to hell. So fundamentally, there is a difference. Although superficially, we may have similar practices of prayer and gathering together, giving of alms, giving money. Those are superficial practices. But the fundamental key differences between worldviews are different. Now, it's important to know that we, as Christians, did not claim Jesus as the only way. Christianity is not exclusive because Christians claim it to be. It is exclusive because Jesus claimed it to be. And that's something very important. We're merely relating His claim, not our claim. I'm not the one who says that Jesus is the only way. It is Jesus Himself that has said it. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. The Apostle Peter preached the same thought. He said, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Even as we sang today, there is no other name by which we can be saved and reconciled back to God. There's only one name and one person. As Paul concurred in 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity. It is the person and the man, Christ Jesus. There's only one that God has provided. He's the only mediator. Now, pluralists may push back and say, well, there is no absolute truth. The funny thing is, by saying that, that is a truth statement in itself. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. For example, if I say 2 plus 2 is 5, is that correct? No, because there's only one answer. 2 plus 2 is equal to, to 4. Because truth is exclusive. It excludes every other answer. There's only one answer. Now, religious pluralism must be rejected because it proposes that multiple religions are true at the same time, even though they contradict each other. The pluralists may say, well, it doesn't matter because your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Now, that's not even being logical or reasonable. Now, pluralism ignores one of the foundational laws of logic. And one of those laws is the law of non-contradiction, which was codified by Aristotle. And the law of non-contradiction says that if something is true, its opposite cannot be true at the same time and in the same way. The nature of truth claim is that if something is true, its opposite has to be false. Those who study philosophy and would understand the law of non-contradiction is these are one of the basic tenets of logic and reason. Now, it's more logical to say that all religions are false than it is to say that all religions are true. It's more logical to say all of them are false than to say that all of them are true. Now, if all religions are true, then Jesus' commission in Matthew 28 to go into all the world and to share the gospel would be irrelevant and useless for us. Because if all religions lead to God, why would Jesus ask us to go and communicate the gospel? There would be no need for it. But Jesus himself has commissioned us to go and convey the gospel of Jesus. The law of non-contradiction. See, Jesus cannot be sinful and sinless at the same time. If there is one God, there can't be many gods. The beauty of Christianity is that it doesn't break any laws of logic. Did you know that there is a flat earth society in America? You know, I was made, made aware, Peter told me that there is one in Newfoundland, Canada as well. Now, who among us would agree with the perception that the earth is flat? Anyone here? Now, while we fight for their right to believe it, we don't have to agree with it. We don't have to agree with it. So we must understand that Christianity, nothing in Christianity is truth is about truth for truth's sake. Jesus didn't say he's the truth just to be right. Because the truth has power. And he said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There is a reason for truth. And truth is to set us free. To give us liberty and freedom. You know there's a story told of a king. He had no queen and no children. And he was getting up in age and he wanted to find a successor to his throne. And so he decided one day to invite all the people in his kingdom to his palace. And he gave them all seeds. And he said that after a certain period of time, I want you to come back. And the person with the most beautiful plant and the biggest plant would be the heir to his throne. So after a period of time, people started coming to the palace and bringing these magnificent and beautiful plants and beautiful flowers. And his whole palace was filled with them. And as he looked around, he saw a young lady that had an empty pot. And he stared at that, and he chose that young lady with the empty pot. And the people were shocked and said, King, why did you choose the lady with the empty pot? We have these beautiful plants that have grown in magnificent sizes. 
And the king replied and said, well, I gave everyone fake seeds. And the little girl was the only one honest enough who didn't switch those seeds. You know, there's something to be said about truth. There are many false claims, but truth seems to always emerge. Truth always seems to emerge. So the question for us today is, is Jesus God? And before we explore whether Jesus is God, it's good to know what other worldviews or religions believe and claim about Jesus. In other words, who is Jesus amongst the other gods? Buddhism teaches that Jesus was not God, but an enlightened man like Buddha. Hinduism teaches that Jesus is the incarnation of God, like Krishna. Islam teaches that Jesus was a man and a prophet, but inferior to Muhammad. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was merely the Archangel Michael and a created being that became a man. Mormonism teaches that Jesus was only a man who became one of many gods and he was the half-brother of Lucifer. New Age guru Deepak Chopra says that Jesus is a state of consciousness that we can all aspire to. And Scientology, the religion of Tom Cruise and John Travolta and others, teach that Jesus was an implant force of Haven about a million years ago. But Christianity teaches that Jesus is God. That God the Father sent His Son to be our Savior. You see, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need is forgiveness. And God has sent us a Savior. How many are glad for Jesus being our Savior this morning? You see, so what makes Jesus different from all other religious leaders? What makes Him different? Why has people over the last 2,000 years been willing to die for Jesus, even those who saw Him die on the cross? There must be something more to His teachings, because there have been other great teachers. There must be something more than His miracles, because there's been others who perform miracles. There has to be something more than His healings, because there's been others who heal people. And there has to be something more than His morally good life, because there have been other good moral people. So what differentiates, what makes Jesus different? Why believe Jesus at such a risk to your life? Now what makes Jesus unique and vindicates all His claims is the resurrection. It's the resurrection. You see, when the earliest followers of Jesus saw Him alive after He was dead, after they talked with Him and touched Him and ate meals with Him, and after they saw Him leave this earth, they were convinced that He was no ordinary man. The resurrection showed that Jesus claimed was who He claimed to be and led to the birth of the most powerful movement the world has ever seen. A movement that has surpassed kings and kingdoms and empires and has spread to nearly every language and country in this world. Because the resurrection is the central pillar and foundation of Christianity. If the resurrection never happened, Christianity falls apart. And this is what Paul was writing about in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look in verses 13 to 19. He says, for if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. But we apostles would be all lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are, mo we are more to be pitied than anyone else in this world. You see, if Jesus did really rise from the dead, we must believe Him, we must follow Him because He defeated death and He did something no other human has ever done before. It's 
that he resurrected from the grave. You know, non-Christian historians of the first century, like Josephus and others, wrote that the Jews were claiming their leader, Jesus of Nazareth, had risen from the dead. And the rapid growth of the early church is clear evidence that something happened 2,000 years ago. Something happened. A group of conservative Jews had the courage to claim Jesus as God and be willing to die for Him. Historians are baffled by this movement, by the sudden rise of the church. What caused these conservative Jews to change so radically and so quickly and be willing to die to allow their families and their children for the early part of the Christian movement to die? What made them? And the most vital evidence for the Christian faith, Paul says, is the proof that God gave us is raising Jesus from the dead. He said, For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone. He proved, not just by the teachings and the miracles and the healings and his life. But he proved to everyone by raising him from the dead. One of the most influential and respectful philosophers of the last half century, Professor Richard Swineberg of Oxford University, a scholar that is especially known for his aptitude in evaluating evidence, argued in a book published by Oxford uh, University Press and said that based on the available historical evidence today, it is about 97% likely that Jesus miraculously rose from the dead. Based on the evidence that's available today, 97% likely that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if you can prove the resurrection never happened, Christianity falls apart. There is no Christian faith. We are wasting our time. I am wasting my time preaching. You are wasting your time coming. The whole thing falls apart. Based on that one single fact that sets Jesus apart from everyone else. I'd like to quickly look at four objections to the resurrection. These are some common objections to the validity of the resurrection. The first is, Jesus didn't really die. This is the official position of Islam. Most scholars and historians actually write off this position because of the historical context of the Roman Empire and how Romans treated criminals. The Romans knew how to kill people. They would kill nearly 6,000 people a day. So they would know how to kill a person. If they captured them and tried them, they weren't letting them go or there's no escaping. And so this does not even hold up to historical scrutiny, this position. Second objection, the body was stolen. Even the disciples initially believed this. But then they saw Jesus, and this objection was gone. And the question for us is, why would the disciples create such an elaborate hoax that Jesus rose from the dead, and then be willing to be tortured, and go through pain and even death for this lie. Lots of people die for lies they think are true. But who dies for a lie that they know is a lie? And that they know they've made up? A lot of people in this world will die for a lie they think is true. But ask yourself, would you die for a lie that you know is a lie and that you made up? I don't think so. The third objection is they went to the wrong tomb. Historians don't believe this theory because the powers that be could have easily taken the dead body and proved to them if they went to the wrong tomb that Jesus was dead. But they couldn't because there was no body found. And even till today, people are still looking for the body of Jesus. The fourth objection is that the disciples borrowed the idea of the resurrection from their surrounding culture. But contrary to popular myth, nobody in the surrounding culture actually believed in a present-day human resurrection. The Greeks followed Plato and Homer, who were dualists, and believed the goal of life was to escape this material world into a spiritual world. And a return to the physical world was undesirable. The Greeks never wanted to come back because they felt that the body was a prison. They wanted to escape the body. And so the Greeks did not have the idea of a resurrection of the body. The Jews, on the other hand, a segment of them believed in the resurrection, but their belief in the resurrection would happen at the end of time, where all people would be resurrected. They did not believe in a mid 
time resurrection, where someone in the middle of time would come back from the dead. So that's why the disciples doubted the resurrection, because they only believed it could happen at the end, not in the middle of time. So this didn't fit in their worldview either, so they couldn't have borrowed it. G.K. Chesterton said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Let me say that again. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And so maybe you're here today and you're unsure which worldview is correct. Which one am I to believe? Or maybe you're here as a Christian and you're still unsure whether Jesus is God and this whole Christianity thing is true. There are many different worldviews to choose from. Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, secular humanism, New Age spirituality, and the list goes on. And since choosing a worldview is probably the most important decision that you and I will ever make, we must do it with a trustworthy method and evaluate the options well. Apologist Ravi Zacharias offers what he calls the 3-4-5 method of analyzing worldviews. And I'd like to just briefly highlight them and encourage you to dig deep and look at it on your own time. He first says there are three tests that a worldview must pass. The three are, it must be logically consistent. Its teachings cannot be self-contradictory. It must pass the test of logic, as we already talked about, the law of non-contradictions. Two or more contradictory statements cannot all be true. So there has to be some logical consistency. Empirically adequate, its teachings must match what we see in reality and supported by some form of evidence when tested. And the third is existentially relevant. Its teachings must speak directly to how we live our lives. There should be meaningfulness in our reality. And then he goes on to say that each worldview must address four ultimate questions. And so take the worldview that you may choose to believe and examine it with these four questions on origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, where do the universe and human beings come from? Is there intelligent design or are we the product of random chance? And what is meaning? Does my worldview give me meaning? What is the meaning or purpose of life? Does this worldview give me meaning to what I'm doing? Morality. Does my worldview help me to know the difference between right and wrong? And destiny. What happens when I die? What happens to my life after I breathe my final breath. And then he talks about five academic disciplines that must be employed to study a worldview. He talks about using theology, the study of God, metaphysics, the study of what is ultimately real, epistemology, the study of how we can know things, ethics, the study of the morality of right and wrong, and anthropology, the study of what and who humans are. And so I want to encourage you to take time to look and study. There's a couple of great resources that I was able to use to prepare this sermon. Got a lot of material from one is uh, Jesus Among Secular Gods, written by Rabbi Zacharias and Vince Vitale, and also a great book called The Problem of God by Mark Clark, a pastor out in Vancouver. Um, great resources. Encourage you to go and study more and, and look into it, because we need to know how to judge our worldview. And know what is true. I'd like to share, give you a little object lesson here about worldviews. This red container can speak to us about our life. And this piece of paper can represent our worldview. All of our worldviews need to support our lives, support us. And so if I put this piece of paper right here, and if I put this container on top, anyone know what might happen? It falls. Because my worldview is not strong enough to support who I am. And so there are a lot of worldviews that are not able to support our lives and support who we are. Anyone want to try and see if you could take this piece of paper? Probably not, right? Does anyone have an idea how I could use the same piece of paper, use a worldview to support this container? There you go. So here's my worldview. When my worldview is supported by truth, 
if it's logically consistent and also empirically adequate, and if my worldview is existentially relevant, and my worldview informs me and answers the questions of origin, where did I come from? And provides me with meaning of who I am and what is my purpose on this earth. And if my worldview informs me of my morality to know the difference between right and wrong, and then provides me with my destiny. What will happen when I die? My worldview provides me with truth statements. And a worldview that is filled with truth are like these lines. These lines that help us and support us. And so now if I take the same piece of paper, this is now my new worldview, that have these truth statements in it, Now it supports it. Now this worldview supports my life. Why? Because these lines that represent truth support me. Because a worldview needs to be true. How many are grateful for a worldview that is truthful? So the question is, why is the path to God so narrow? Why is the path to heaven so narrow? For the same reason the law of gravity is unique. Truth by definition will always be restrictive and have its boundaries. So why do these boundaries do not include all people? Why is the path to Jesus so narrow? Now it would be narrow if we had many laws to keep and money to give and systems to get out of or systems to get in. Because the path to Jesus is not actually narrow. It's not narrow. Rabbi Zacharias said this, The narrowness lies in the fact that I cannot manufacture my own truth. All God asks of us is to accept the provision that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. Do you know why people say Christianity is narrow? It's because you cannot manufacture your own truth statements. And that is why people feel it's narrow. But actually, it's very broad to accept anyone. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. God welcomes all people who are willing to come to him. Every other religion has a prophet pointing us to God. But Jesus came as God in search for us. So what do we do with these truth statements and the exclusivity of Christ? The exclusivity of Christ and truth should not make us proud or arrogant or isolated, but actually rather more compassionate and have a desire to communicate the good news of the gospel to others. We must be willing to share the truth, but with an important component, Paul writes in Ephesians, known as love. We are to speak the truth in love. Jimmy Evans said, truth without love is surgery without anesthesia. But grace or love without truth is like a bottle without medicine. Truth is not a weapon to wield around to cut down other people or defend yourself, but truth is to be used as a bridge to bring people to God. So how do you and I, if you believe the worldview of Christianity as being true and the only way, respond to this? Is it to tear people down or to build a bridge to bring people to Jesus? There's an Indian proverb that says, don't give someone a rose to smell after you've cut off their nose. You see, what we often do is we tear down other people's beliefs and tell them that they're wrong and then present them to Jesus. You can't give them the beauty and the fragrance of Jesus after you've cut them and torn them down. The beauty of Jesus, His truth claims, simply will arise. Jesus doesn't need to be defended because truth is always the winner. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I want to encourage us today that Jesus is the true and living way. And we must communicate that truth with compassion and love to people. If you know Jesus is true and if there's only one God and one Savior for humanity may motivate us to talk to our friends and our co-workers and our family members to present to them Jesus Christ, the Savior of 
the war. I'd like to conclude my sermon this morning with an example of people that responded to truth with compassion. It was the 1800s in America and there was no foreign missions board. Missionaries were not going out of America at the time. There was no missions board. In 1806, August of 1806, in Williamson, Massachusetts, a group of five students gathered together in the meadow to pray about their calling and their future to serve God. And as they were gathering, a thunderstorm came and lightning was there. So they ran and hid in a haystack. And it's known as the Haystack Prayer Meeting. You can Google it and read about it. And there these five men gathered and prayed. And the funny thing is one of their names uh, was Samuel Mills. <laughs> and as they prayed, they made a determination to be missionaries to go around the world. And in 1810, a foreign missions board was officially formed. And in 1812, the first missionary, Adonidam Judson, was sent out to India. And Samuel Mills was influential in forming the American Bible Society. And from that point on, missionaries started to leave America and go throughout the world to share the gospel. And I'd like to highlight two missionaries, or three missionaries particularly, um, that were very influential. One was Samuel Fiskreen, Dr. Samuel Fiskreen, and Cyrus and Susan Mills. And these missionaries decided about 150 years ago, around 1848 or so, to go all the way to a small little island known as Ceylon at that time, or today Sri Lanka, to share the gospel. And as they went to this island, motivated out of compassion and truth, to go to a country where they didn't know the language or the people, they didn't have email or telephone to communicate with their family back home, they had to go on a boat ride that took them months and months to travel, experience all kinds of sicknesses and diseases where their families were affected, to share the truth of Jesus to a people they did not know. And one of those people that they communicated was with my great-great-grandfather. And when they shared the gospel with him, he believed it. But his family didn't like it. They were Hindus, and I come from a lineage of, from Hindus. And at that time, five generations ago, he decided to believe in the truth of Jesus. And when he was baptized, he took the name of the missionary that led him to Jesus, who was Cyrus Mills, and that's why some of you may look at me and wonder, where did I get my name Mills from? <laughs> and that's how it came. It was in memory and honor for this missionary that communicated the gospel and salvation to him. His family didn't like it. They tried to poison him, and he almost died. But after three days of prayer, God healed him. His family ostracized him. He couldn't even go to the wedding of his only sister. He had to be far away. He was hated. But he saw the truth of Jesus as something to be embraced and loved. And then the other missionary, Dr. Samuel Fistreen, brought him under his wing, taught him medicine, and established one of the first medical mission areas in all of South Asia. And there he became a doctor, and there on a lineage both of Christian Christianity and medical uh, professional uh, people came from his lineage and his line to bring healing and the gospel in that region. Now the interesting thing, around 2005, and these missionaries eventually came back to America. And in 2005, I was in San Francisco. I was, I was made known that some of the correspondence between the missionaries and my great-great-grandfather was in a university or a college that was actually started by Samuel and Cyrus, uh, sorry, Cyrus and Susan Mills, known as Mills College. So I went over to Oakland, went into their library, and went into their archives. And as I was going through their archives and reading their diaries, I came across the picture, as you can see here, of my great-great-grandfather and his family that was sent by him to these missionaries, and these missionaries kept it in their library and their correspondence. And as I look at that picture and as I held it and took a photo, I realized the value of his life and his stance of faith. And at the same time, there's a picture of the tombstone of the missionary Cyrus Mills and his wife Susan. And as I stood there, I just thank God that these people were willing to sacrifice their life to go to another country. And because of them, I'm here today. I'm here today. And it's amazing. I spent 10 years of my ministry in the U.S. sharing in the same places that these missionaries came from in Massachusetts. And here God, 150 plus years later, the fruit of that was another pastor in America sharing the gospel. 
And I share that to encourage you to share that when you share the gospel, if one person is saved, it changes a whole generation. It changes an entire lineage. And may we be inspired to know the truth of Jesus and share that to our friends and family, knowing that you will create a new legacy and forge a new path for an entire group of people. Let us pray today. Father, I thank you that as we just honor Jesus, that Jesus, you are the true and the living God, that you would inspire us to continue to share your truth to the nations that you have brought to this city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.